Journey of the Mind into God Part 1 Prologue I shall begin by invoking, through his Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the first principle, from whom all enlightenment descends as through the Father of Light, and from whom all that it is given is of the best, and all of whose gifts are perfect. In this way, through the intercession of the Most Holy Virgin Mary, who bore the same God and our Lord Jesus Christ, and through the intercession of the Blessed Francis, our Guide and Father, he might give illumination to the eyes of our mind, to point our feet in the direction of peace, which reaches beyond perception. This is the peace which our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed and gave to us, and which our Father Francis reiterated, beginning and ending all his teachings with peace, choosing in all his greetings peace and longing, in all his contemplation for ecstatic peace, just like the citizen of Jerusalem who was peaceful with those who hated peace. Ask for what concerns the peace of Jerusalem. He said, for he knew, given that it is written in the scriptures, that his place is made in peace and his dwelling is in Zion, that the throne of Solomon was nothing if not peaceful. So following the example of the Blessed Father Francis, I made an exhaustive spiritual search for this peace. I, a sinner, the seventh minister general of the brothers following the passing of the Blessed Father himself. It happened then, in the thirty-third year after his passing, that, by divine permission, in love, because it was a quiet place, I went seeking Mount Alverna, where I remained. While considering some ways of ascending into God, a miracle occurred to me which was identical with that which had occurred to Blessed Francis himself in that same place. This was a vision of the seraph, winged in the likeness of the crucified. As I thought about this, it suddenly struck me that this vision showed the suspension of the Father in contemplation and the path by which he had reached his contemplation. So, by means of these six wings, it is possible accurately to understand the six levels of enlightenment by which the soul, as though taking steps and making gradual movement, transcends into peace through an ecstatic deepening of Christian wisdom. This path, however, is nothing but a burning love for the crucified, which so transformed Paul into Christ, being caught up in the third heaven. So much so that he said, I am crucified with Christ, but it is now not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It was also this love which so absorbed Francis's mind and expressed itself in his flesh for two years before his death, during which time he bore the most sacred stigmata of the passion. The image of the six seraphic wings implies the six grades of enlightenment, which begin with the created world and lead ultimately to God into whom no one truly enters except through the crucified. For whoever does not enter by the door, but ascends in some other way, is but a trespasser and a thief. And if anyone goes through the gate, he will enter and leave, and thus find the pasture. Therefore, John says in the Apocalypse, Blessed are those who wash their clothes in the blood of the Lamb, their power will lie in the tree of life, and they will gain access to the city through the gates. What he is saying here is that a person will not reach the heavenly Jerusalem through contemplation, 
unless they enter through the blood of the Lamb as through a gate. For one is not disposed in any way to divine contemplation, which leads to mental disassociation, unless, like Daniel, one is a man of desires. Desires are inflamed within us in two forms, through the clamor of prayer, which makes us cry out with an aching heart, and through the brilliance of investigation, through which the mind turns itself most directly and most intensely towards the rays of light. My first invitation, then, is to the cry of prayer through the crucified Christ, whose blood purges us of the filth of vice. After all, the reader might think that to read without facility, to speculate without devotion, to investigate without wonder, to consider without exultation, to work hard without piety, to have knowledge without love, to have intelligence without humility, to study without divine grace, and to observe without divinely inspired wisdom, might be enough. Therefore, to those predisposed by divine grace, to the pious and the humble, to the sensitive and devout, to those anointed with the oil of gladness, both those who love divine wisdom and those who are inflamed with desire for it, and to those who are willing to magnify, to admire, and even to taste God, I offer the following ideas, pointing out that, unless the mirror of our mind has not been wiped over and polished, little or nothing will be observed. So, man of God, before conscience bites again, and before you raise your eyes to the glittering rays of wisdom, take good care, just in case you catch sight of these very rays and fall into the terrible pits of shadows. I thought it useful to divide this text into seven chapters, setting their titles out here so as to facilitate an understanding of what it is to be discussed. I would therefore ask that the intention of the author be considered more than the work itself, the sense of the words more than the inept writing style, their truth more than their elegance, the exercise of affection more than the intellectual erudition. One should not, moreover, run speedily through the development of these ideas. Rather, one should think through them with the greatest of care. Here begins the vision of the poor man in the desert. Chapter 1 The gradual path into God and the perception of him through his imprints upon the universe. Blessed is the man to whom you offer help. He has placed a flight of steps in his heart, in the veil of tears, in the place where he put them. Since beatitude is nothing other than the fruit of the highest good, and since the highest good is superior to us, no one can achieve this state of beatitude unless they rise beyond themselves, and that not with the body, but with the heart. But we cannot be raised beyond ourselves, unless a superior virtue raise us. For however much the inner steps are set out, nothing can take place unless divine assistance is also present. Divine help Furthermore, accompany those who seek it with a humble and devoted heart, which is to long for it in this veil of tears. And this is done through fervent prayer. Prayer, therefore, is my mother and the origin of this upward movement. For this reason, in his book on mystical theology, Dionysius the Areopagite wanted to teach us about mental disassociation first of all offers a prayer. So let us pray and ask the Lord our God, Lead me, Lord, in your way, and let me step into your truth. 
Let my heart be glad, and let me be awed by your name. Through praying in this way, one is enlightened and becomes acquainted with the steps leading into the divine. For since our circumstance is the ladder which leads us into God, and since among things there are imprints and images, physical and spiritual things, temporal and transtemporal things, and, in this regard, things outside us and inside us, we therefore arrive at the point of considering the first principle, which is the most spiritual, and which is eternal and superior to us. It is appropriate that we go beyond the imprint, which is physical and temporal and outside us. This is, go this is going beyond and is to be led unto the path of God. It is appropriate that we enter into our mind, which is the trans-temporal image of God, spiritual and within us. This entering into our mind is to step into the truth of God. It is appropriate that, by looking at the first principle, we transcend into the eter eternal most spiritual and superior to us, and this is to be glad in the knowledge of God and to dwell in the truth of His Majesty. So this is the path of three days in solitude, the threefold enlightenment of a single day, evening, morning, and midday. This in turn refers to the threefold existence of things, matter, intelligence and the art of eternity according to what has been said let it be made he has made it and it has been made this also refers to the freefold substance in christ who is our ladder that being the physical the spiritual and the divine according to this threefold development our mind has three principal aspects. The first aspect deals with the physical, and this is referred to as the animal or the sensory. The second aspect looks within the self and into the self, and this is referred to as the spirit. The third aspect is superior to the self, and this is referred to as the mind. From the point of view of all these aspects, our mind should completely immerse itself within God and delight in Him with its entire mind, heart, and soul. Which activity constitutes simultaneously both Christian wisdom and a perfect observance of the law? Since these aspects already mentioned come in pairs, as when one considers God to be the Alpha and the Omega, or else sees God in one of these aspects either through a mirror or in a mirror, or else, given that one of a pair can be seen mixed up with the other, it must therefore also be seen in its own pure form. So it is necessary that these three principal steps work themselves out as a group of six. God created the macrocosm in six days and rested on the seventh, and through six stages of enlightenment the microcosm is led, in a most consequent way, into the stillness of contemplation. Among the symbolic treatments of this are the six steps which lead upward to the throne of Solomon the six-winged seraph seen by Isaiah, the six days after which God called upon Moses from a cloud, and six, day, six days after which, according to Matthew, Christ led the disciples onto the mountain and was transfigured before them. So, alongside the six levels of ascension into God, there are six levels of the soul's potential, 
through which we climb from the depths to the heights and from those things which are external to those which are internal through which we move together from the temporal to the eternal these are perception imagination reason intellect intelligence and the mind's highest point at which the spark of conscient action catches hold we have these levels placed naturally within us they are deformed by error reformed by grace purified by what is just developed through experience and perfected by wisdom now at the point of creation man was made for the stillness of contemplation and for that reason god placed him in a paradise of delights but by turning away from the true light towards relative good he was bent down under the weight of his own error and his whole line under the weight of this basic error which infects humanity in two ways that is by mental ignorance and by physical desire in this way man is utterly blind and sits bent over in the darkness not seeing the light of heaven unless grace cares for him offering him justice to counteract his desire and both the experience and wisdom to counteract his ignorance this is done in its entirety by jesus christ who has been made by God to be our wisdom and justice and sanctification and our redemption while he is the virtue of God and the wisdom of God and while he is the word incarnate and full of grace and truth he has made grace and truth that is to say he has instilled the grace of love which because it comes from a pure heart and from good conscience and from genuine faith is able to rectify the entire soul according to the three visions previously described he was taught the experience of truth according to the three aspects of theology the symbolic the literal and the mystical so that through the symbolic we might rightly use our perception through the literal we might rightly use our intelligence and through the mystical we might reach the state beyond mental activity and there be enraptured it is therefore necessary that whoever wants to ascend into god must by avoiding error which deforms one's nature exercise their natural powers which were described above thus through our prayer we reconstitute our grace through our behavior we truly purify ourselves through our meditation we develop our enlightened experience and through our contemplation we perfect our wisdom just as no one comes to wisdom except through grace truth and experience so no one comes to contemplation except through analytical meditation pure behavior and devout prayer just as grace is the basis of the correct attitude of the will and of the clarity of analytical reasoning so we should first pray then live in purity and then gradually understanding the true appearance of things ascend the levels of understanding finally arriving on the exalted man mountain where we see the god of gods in sion so since one is first to ascend rather than descend jacob's ladder let us situate the first step at the bottom by considering that we perceive this entire world as being a mirror through this we pass into god the supreme creator as true hebrews passing over from egypt into the land again 
and again promised to our ancestors as Christians, passing over with Christ from this world to the Father, and as lovers of wisdom, which says to us, Pass over to me all who desire me, and be fulfilled by my generations, for by beauty and the number of them can their Creator be seen. Moreover, the highest power and wisdom and benevolence of the Creator shines in created things, announced in three ways to the inner perception by the physical perception. For the physical perception serves the intellect, either through rationally investigating, faithfully believing, or intellectually contemplating. In contemplating the intellect considers the current existence of things in believing, it considers the habitual course of things, and in reasoning it considers the potential perfection of things. According to the first aspect, the person who contemplates sees things in themselves as possessing weight, number, and dimensionality their weight as being where they are sighted, and their physical distribution, their number as being how they are distinguished, and their dimensionality as being how they are limited from one another. And so they are seen to have a modality, a beauty and an order, in addition to having substance, potential and activity. From these things as from an imprint, there is seen to come together that which leads to an understanding of the immense power, wisdom, and goodness of the Creator. According to the second aspect, the person who believes sees the world as having an origin, a course, and an end. For, through faith, we believe that the ages have been prepared for the word of life. Through faith, we believe that he seasons of the three laws, of nature, of written text, and of grace, succeed one another in a most orderly linear development. And, through faith, we believe that the world is to be brought to an end by a final act of realization. Thus, one is aware of power in the first place, of, of providence in the second place, and of the justice of the supreme principle in the third place. According to this third aspect, the person who investigates by reasoning sees that certain things simply exist, that other things exist and live, but that other things exist and live and discern. The first of these is the lowest level, the second the middle level, and the third the best level. And furthermore it is seen that certain things are only corporal, and certain things partly corporal and partly spiritual. From this it follows that still other things are entirely spiritual, and are better and more worthy than those found in either of the groups. On the other hand, it is also seen that certain things are mutable and corruptible, as are mundane things, and that certain things are mutable and incorruptible, as are divine things. From this it follows that certain things are immutable and incorruptible, as are things beyond the divine. There is a natural development, therefore, from these visible things, towards a consideration of the power, wisdom, and goodness of God, as the being, living and understanding, as the purely spiritual, incorruptible, and unchangeable. This consideration extends outward according to the sevenfold condition of created things, which is the sevenfold testimony of divine powers and goodness, 
that being the origin, magnitude, multitude, physical appearance, the fullness, the operation, and the order of all things. The origin of things, according to their creation, distinction, and embellishment, and as much as it deals with the work of the six days of creation, speaks of the divine power which produced all things from nothing. The divine wisdom which clearly distinguishes one thing from another, and the divine goodness which gen generously adorns all things. Magnitude is concerned with the length, breadth, and depth of things, according to their excellence, which extends far and wide and deeply, as can be seen in the diffusion of light. This, together with the effect of their most interior, continual, and diffuse activity, as can be seen in the activity of fire, manifestly shows the extent of the power, wisdom, and goodness of the triune God who, in all things, exists as unconstrained power, presence, and essence. The multitude of things according to their general, special, and individual diversity, in substance, in form or figure, and efficacious beyond human understanding, manifestly suggest and shows the immensity of the three conditions in God, as previously described. Physical appearance is in accordance with the lights, forms, and colors of simple, mixed, and even composite bodies, whether celestial and mineral, stone and metal, plant and animal, also evidently proclaims these three things. The fullness of things, according to which matter is full of forms due to the seminal reasons, form is full of power due to active potential, power is full of effects due to its efficiency, manifestly declares this thing once more. The manifold activity of those things which are either natural, or artificial, or moral, due to their most extensive variety, show the immensity of his power, art, and goodness, which for all things is the cause of existence, the rationality for understanding, and the way of living. Order figures out the duration situation and influence, that is, by what is before and what is after, what is superior and what is inferior, what is noble and what is less noble, it clearly suggests the primacy, sublimity, and dignity of the first principle, as far as it regards the affinity of his power. Furthermore, the law of divine laws, precepts and judgments in the book of scripture clearly suggests the immensity of his wisdom. Lastly, the order of divine sacraments, rewards and punishments in the body of the church clearly shows the immensity of his goodness. In this way, order itself leads us by the hand to the first and supreme, the most powerful the most wise, and the best. Whoever is not enlightened by the splendors of such created things is blind. Whoever does not awaken at such a noise is deaf. Whoever does, doesn't not praise God because of all things is mute. Whoever does not turn towards the first principle because of these indications is stupid. So open your eyes, prick up your spiritual ears, loosen your lips and wake your heart, so that you may see, hear, praise, love, adore, magnify and honor your God in all created things, just in case the entire universe rises up as one against you. For this reason, indeed, 
the entire universe will fight against those who are unaware. But for those who are aware, there will be glory. For those who, according to the prophet, can say, In what will you do, Lord? You have given me delight, and I shall be joyful at the work of your hands. How wonderful are your works, Lord! You have done all things in wisdom, and the earth is full of your riches. Chapter 2 The Vision of God Through His Imprints Upon the World as We Perceive It However, since concerning the mirror of perception, not only does it happen that God is contemplated through these things as through imprints, but also in these things to the extent that He is in them in essence, power, and presence. This consideration is superior to what was just explained and, to, and so is held to be the second level of contemplation. By this we should be led by the hand to contemplate all the creative things which enter into our minds through physical perception. You should note that this world, the macrocosm, enters into our soul the microcosm, through the gates of the five senses, according to the apprehension, enjoyment, and analysis of these things which are perceived. This is obvious, since some things are generating, other things are generated, and still other things are controlling the former and the latter. The things which are generating are simple. They are the celestial bodies and the four elements. This is because whatever gets generated and produced from the elements is produced and generated by the activity of natural power, due to the power of the light, which unifies the differences which exist between the elements. The things which are generated, on the other hand, are bodies, composed from the elements, that is to say, minerals, vegetables, sensible things, and human bodies. The things which rule the former and the latter are spiritual substances, whether entirely conjoined, such as animals, or separately conjoined, such as rational spirits, or else inseparably conjoined such as celestial spirits, which philosophers call intelligence, and which we refer to as angels. Philosophers hold that it is they who move the celestial bodies, and so to them is attributed the administration of the universe, taking up the influence of power from the first cause, which is God, which influence they pour out through the work of government which follows the natural course of things. Theologians, moreover, attribute to these spirits the control over the universe according to the power of the Supreme God which deals with the work of reparation according to what are called the spirits of administration sent because of those who are seizing the inheritance of salvation. So a human, called the microcosm, has five senses, like five gates, through which enters into the soul the perception of all things. Through vision there enter sublime and luminous bodies and other colored things, and through touch solid and earthly bodies. Through the three intermediate senses enter the intermediate bodies, liquids through taste, auditory phenomena through hearing, and vapors through smell. Vapors have about them something humid, something gaseous, something fiery or hot, which can be perceived from the smoke given off by incense. 
Through these gates there enter both simple bodies and their admixtures in the form of composite bodies. Because through our senses we perceive not only specifics such as light, sound, odor, taste, and the four primary qualities which touch apprehends, but also general things such as number, magnitude, figure, stillness, and movement. Since all things which move are moved by something else, and since certain things such as animals move and remain at rest until their own stream, at the same time as we are aware of the movement of bodies through the five senses, we are led by the hand towards acquaintance with spiritual movers, in the same way as an effect leads to an acquaintance with its causes. So, according to these three classes, the entire perceivable world enters into the human soul through apprehension. Moreover, these external things are at first perceived as entering the soul by way of the five senses. I should say that they enter, not in substance, but through their appearance, generated at first at their core, and from their core they move to the external organ, and from there they move into the interior organ, and finally into that power which apprehends them. In this way, the generation of species at the core and from the core of the organ and the conversion through the apprehending power, all of these things mean that the soul apprehends them as being external. If this apprehension is of something agreeable, there follows enjoyment. The sense, furthermore, takes a proportionate delight in the perception of the object through its abstract appearance, whether through seeing its beauty, or through smelling or hearing its savor, or through tasting or touching its wholesomeness. But since the species holds the rationale for its form, power, and activity, it indicates thereby how it flows from the origin into the center, passing through that point to the end where it acts. For this reason, proportionality is found either in its appearance, which accounts for its physicality or form, and for which reason it is called beauty, since beauty is nothing but numerical equality, or a certain distribution of parts in suitable color, or it is found in its potential and power, for which reason it is called savor, so long as the acting power is not disproportionate to the recipient, or else it is found in its efficacy and the impression which it makes, which are proportionate when the agent supplies what the recipient lacks, which is to save and nourish itself, and which appears mainly in taste and touch. Thus, following the threefold reason for delight, the enjoyment of delightful things outside of the self enter the soul by means of their appearance. Following apprehension and enjoyment, there comes analysis. This is not simply the analysis of whether something be white or black, since this pertains to the specific perception, nor of whether it be wholesome or harmful, since this pertains to interior perception, but it is also an analysis to establish why something produces delight. In other words, an inquiry into the reason for the delight which is due to the object. This is also the case when a rationale is sought for beauty, or savor, or wholesomeness, which is found to be the proportion of equality. The rationale for equality, moreover, is the same in great things as in small things. It never alters its dimensions, 
nor does it change nor pass away, and neither is it altered by movement. It abstracts from place, time, and movement, and thus is unchangeable, unlimited, and in all things spiritual. So analysis is an act which, through abstraction and purification, causes the perceivable object, apprehended directly by the senses, to enter into the intellectual power. And in this way the whole world has to enter the human soul through the gates of the senses, according to these three activities. All of these things are imprints through which we can look upon our God. For the perceived object is an appearance born at the core and then impressed upon the organ itself, which impression gives rise to the object with which one is to become acquainted. This clearly suggests that that which is the invisible image of God, the splendor of his glory and the form of his substance, which is universal due to his primary generation, in the same way as an object generates its appearance from its core, is united by the grace of union as something perceivable to the bodily organs of a rational individual. That union is led back to the Father in the form of a primordial source and its object. Thus, since all things with which one can become acquainted have to generate their own perceived form, and since in them there can be seen the eternal generation of the word as in a mirror, they clearly proclaim the eternal emanation of the Son and the image from God the Father. According to this approach, the object giving pleasure is perceived as beautiful, pleasing, and wholesome which implies that in its first object is original beauty, pleasure, and wholesomeness, in which there is supreme por proportionality and equality to its source, in which there appears an uncorrupting power, not through illusion, but through the truth of apprehension. In this there is a salvific impression which impels both substitutes and everything that may be lacking in apprehension. If, therefore, delight is a conjunction of the pleasurable to the pleasurable, and if only the appearance of God accounts for the highest of beauty, pleasure, and wholesomeness, and if that is united according to the truth and to the interiority, and to the fullness which fills its capacity, then it can clearly be seen that in God alone is the source and true delight, and that we are led by the hand to seek the same thing in all which delights us. However, by a more excellent and more immediate method, analysis leads us to look upon the eternal truth with greater certainty. For, whilst analysis rises through a reasoned abstraction of place, time, and transformation, and thereby through the immutable, unlimited, and endless reason of dimension, succession, and trans transmutation, there, however, remains nothing which is entirely immutable, unlimited, and endless, apart from that which is eternal and everything which is eternal in God, or in God. And, therefore, however, more certainly, we analyze all things, we analyze them according to this reason, which is clearly the reason of all things, the infallible rule and the light of truth in which all things are illumined infallibly, indelibly, indubitably, unbreakably, indistinguishably, unchangeably, unconfinably, intermittably, indivisibly, and intellectually. And so, as we consider those laws, with which we judge with certainty, 
those things which we perceive, while they are infallible and indubitable to the intellect and the one apprehending, indelible to the memory, and of the one recalling and unbreakable and indistinguishable to the intellect of the one judging, so, because, as Augustine says, no one judges from them, but through them. It is required that they be unchangeable and incorruptible because necessary, unconfinable because unlimited, endless because eternal, and, for this reason, indivisible because intellectual and incorporeal, not made but uncreated, eternally existing in that art of eternity, from which, through which, and consequent to which, all elegant things are given form. For this reason they cannot with certainty be gauged save through that which is not only produced all other forms, but which also preserves and distinguishes all things, as in all things the essence holding the form, and the rule directing it, and through this our mind analyzes all things which enter into it through the senses. This observation is further broadened according to the consideration of seven kind of number by which one climbs fully, as up seven steps, into God. This is what Augustine says in the sixth chapter on music, in his book The True Religion, where he assigns different kinds of number, ascending stepwise from perceived things into the universal Creator, so that God might be seen in all things. For he holds that there are numbers in bodies and, primarily, in sound and voices, which he calls sounds. There are numbers which have been abstracted and received by our senses, which he calls indicators. There are numbers proceeding from the soul into the body, as are perceived in gesticulation and in activity, and these he calls movements. There are numbers in the delight of the senses, which comes from noticing the perceptions which are received, and these he calls sensations. There are numbers in retained memories, and these he calls memories. There are even numbers through which we distinguish all things which he calls decisions, and which, as has been said, are necessarily superior to the mind as infallible and indistinguishable. These also imprint upon the mind artificial numbers, which Augustine does not include in these steps since they are connected with decisions. And from these flow the movement numbers, and from which are created many forms of artificiality, with the result that there appears an ordered descent from the highest level to the lowest, via that which is in between. From these we also ascend stepwise, via numbers of sound, by ways of the indicators, sensations, and memories. Since all things are beautiful and, to some extent, give delight, and since beauty and delight are not other than proportionate, and since proportion is found at first in number, it is necessary that everything be numerical. Thus, number is the foremost exemplar in the maker's mind, and, in things, the foremost imprint which guides us to wisdom. Because, when it is most evident to all and closest to God, it is most nearly as though the seven kinds of numbers lead into God and cause him to be realized in all physical and perceived things. While we apprehend the numerical, we take delight in numerical proportion and analyze most securely by means of the laws of numerical proportion.